this is, um, I got to kind of walk around yesterday when we had our little gathering and there's so many faces of people that, that are, we're all trying to kind of move in this direction and do the same thing and it's so nice to be able to be together. And uh, I'm super happy to just get to talk about a conversation around accountability because I don't, I don't know if it's like this for you, but in my organization, um, we really, really struggled slash still struggle with this idea of accountability and how it fits in. Um, for those of you that don't know, I used to work for a big organization. I worked for GE. I worked for GE Aviation for a while and then worked across a bunch of their businesses. And we had the honor of bringing a lot of folks in the human performance space and the human and organizational performance space into our organization. And we did our very best to learn from what they were teaching us. And we made a lot of progress. And then like probably many of you feel, we also, you know, like two steps forward, 20 steps back, 10 steps forward, one step back. I mean, it always felt like we were on this sort of roller coaster of making progress. And one of the places that we got stuck over and over and over and over again was this notion of accountability. What does it mean? How does it fit in? As I'm sure many of your organizations are, we are a, we're a highly regulated aviation is like, like many other organizations. Um, many other business sectors. We also were firmly entrenched in the idea that kind of our standard operating procedures were perfect, like that was the belief system. I don't, maybe this is not true in your world, but this is how we saw our procedures. And for sure, as Rob was saying, we need procedures, we need great procedures. But this is how we saw ours, and they probably weren't supposed to actually get this level of credit. We pictured them like, picture pedestal, picture standard operating procedure, picture lights, picture angels. <laughs> we thought we were that good, we really did. Um, and we were good, don't get me wrong, we were good, but we weren't that good, meaning, meaning it wasn't always the way. It was a good way, but it didn't always apply in every situation, and so similar to probably all of your worlds, if we had an event happen, then we would get stuck on this notion of like, well, the person didn't follow the procedure, and, and, and it's the way, and therefore we need to make sure that people understand that that's not okay, and that's where we would get just mired in confusion. It took me a long time, personally, to try to sort through what that confusion looked like and how we actually apply the concepts in practice. And I'm gonna do my best to share some of that. Hopefully it's helpful, you can tell me if it is or if it isn't. But I'd like to kind of talk through what it meant for me to, tr to figure, like when am I supposed to discipline somebody? I don't know, like whatever, no, never, I don't know. Um, to do that, I'd like to tell you a story, probably a story the first time that it started to make some amount of sense to me. We're gonna play Pictionary, are you ready? So for this story, I have to draw something, and this is my drawing. Don't get too excited. What do you think we're looking at so far? Should we got chairs, you can yell it out, chairs? Chairs, okay. Now what do we got? Toilets, yeah, that sounds right. Anyone else have something different than toilets? Now that you see it, you can't unsee it? <laughs> Double down on the toilets at this point? <laughs> All right, well, these, these are not toilets. Um, what this is supposed to represent, I really think scale is the issue here. It's supposed to represent two large test cells. So in the, so somebody did say jet engine, so you were right, so whoever, yeah, nice. Um, it's supposed to represent two large test cells. In a test cell, like what, what you do, if you're not familiar, you, you take a, an engine, after you put it together, you need to test it to make sure it's functioning. So you have to put it in a place to do that, to simulate on-wing conditions. You hook it up to high temperature, high pressure equipment, you run it through its paces, you make sure it's okay to actually send out to a customer. That's what these buildings are for. Now the toilet bowl is supposed to be the jet engine. Um, thank you, right? You got it, Jennifer got it. Um, and then the people who are running the test are actually in a control room and they're separated from the test. And that's on purpose, right? So that's like just good PSM design because if you did have something that went wrong with this engine, you wanna make sure that the people are not near it because if you had any sort of error in the actual assembly process, you could have this thing 
catch on fire, it could blow up. So as long as you're not standing next to the engine, you're protected in the control room. So these test cells were designed, built, and then put into production while I was out of sight. Now I want to tell you that the proper way, the procedural way, to go from test cell one to test cell two is to walk out a door, down a set of stairs, around the outsides of the building, up a set of stairs, and back in. But there happened to be a room that held all of the high temperature and high pressure equipment needed to run the tests. And it happened to be between these two, betwixt, if you will, betwixt these two test cells. And there happened to be a door on either side, just for ease of access of the maintenance team. Now, when you're operating the test cell, you're not supposed to use that door. Actually, there was a very large sign on the door. So if you picture this as a door, it's about half the size of the doors. Big yellow sign, because we all know yellow fixes everything in safety, right? So big yellow sign. And the yellow sign said, do not enter while test cell is running, could result in death. Because if you're in that area and any of that high temperature, high pressure equipment failed and you're standing right next to it, you probably are not going to go home. Okay. So, question for you. How long do you think it took from the time that we put these in production, how long do you think it took before people started to use that corridor with all that high temperature, high pressure equipment despite the signs on the door? How long do you think it took before people started to use it as a pass-through? First test a day. I don't really know, to be honest with you, I don't know, but I found out about it on day three. I just happened to be in the area checking if things were running well, and I saw somebody use this door with this giant sign on it while the test was running, and I was like, that feels like a problem. Uh, okay, so imagine you're me, or you're you, if you want to, and, and this is the scenario, and you are some, in some way in charge of it, right? Either you're, maybe you're a safety professional, maybe you're the supervisor in the area, you know, maybe you're the plant manager, whoever you want to be, whoever you are. Um, how would you want to manage that situation? Like, what do you want to do? Like, what should we do? We got to lock the doors over here. Anyone who's in the, the lock the door train, you can just put up your hand if you want, lock the door train. What else do we want to do? I mean, what else do you want to do? Make it easier? Yeah. Maybe a, a better way, a different way? Anyone else on that train? Say it again. Yeah, so we say it was for ease of access to the maintenance people, yes. Yeah, talk to the maintenance folks first, kind of figure out what they need it for, yeah. Anyone else have a different thought of what we should do? Make it safe for them to use it is a suggestion over here. Interlock the doors is another suggestion. Separate access, another suggestion. Have a meeting. Have a meeting is another suggestion. A specifically a highly unproductive meeting, which we all, no, 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 I have a meeting. Right, so talk to folks. So this is, so um, I wrote down what, what is commonly said. Um, oops, well, let's go back. Commonly said. See, if, I mean, if you have other ideas than this, that's, that's fantastic. Just like in general, we kind of think we want to interlock the doors or maybe lock the doors. The, the bigger the size, by the way, is more often like how, how often it's said. So like my own version of a word cloud that's poorly done. So interlock the doors, lock the doors, uh, create a safer or new path, um, explain the why of the rule, um, ask people why they're using it, observe, coach, correct, discipline. Those are generally the, like, the span of answers. Now I want to tell you what I did. <laughs> in real life. Um, and as we go, I would love if you can just rip me to shreds. Like, <laughs> no, seriously. So as we go, I'm going to tell you what I did, and then I would love for you to tell me why I was, why I probably shouldn't have done that. And we're, we're going to think through it together. At the time that this happened, this is about between 10 and 15 years ago for me, and I had heard about human and organizational performance. I didn't really know how to use any of the concepts. I was a mess. Um, I was trying, but I was failing multiple times. Um, and, and I went to school for chemical engineering, so I wasn't like 
I wasn't safety trained in school, but my company had done a really good job teaching me about how to be a safety professional, so I had all of that training in the back of my mind. And I gotta tell you, when I saw this as the, the situation, my first thought was that we should probably interlock the doors, right? Because the engineering hierarchy of controls, like I'm feeling really good about interlocking the doors. Um, I wanted it to operate, I mean, similar to your microwave door, I want you to open that door and it's gonna shut everything down. So even if you, you know, decided to go in there, for whatever reason, you're not gonna be exposed to the hazard. That's my thought. I go to the plant manager and I say, hey, is it okay if I ask the engineer to draw this up so we could see how much it's gonna cost? And he laughed at me. Any idea why he laughed at me? He's not a bad person, he's a lovely human. He laughed at me though. The reason he laughed at me is because these test cells, they are FAA approved and they are FAA certified. So what that means is any design change to it, you have to get the FAA to come back and you have to prove to them, and I don't know if you know this, but apparently just like shutting down an engine is not really easy to do, right? So like the idea of having something open a door and the engine shut down and all of that high temperature and high pressure equipment no longer functions, we would have had to go to the FAA and through a series of tests and experiments show that we weren't going to damage the engine and that represented millions of dollars of loss. And so he said, nah, we're not gonna do that. Actually, this is a simple rule. People need to follow it. They need to comply with it. There's really no reason for people to be this lazy. So, I'm stuck in this idea of like, well, are people being lazy or is it like, I don't know, maybe they don't understand. Maybe they don't understand that it's a real risk, maybe this sign doesn't feel real to them. So I decided, this was a phrase that we used a lot in my organization, I decided I was gonna go try to win the hearts and minds. So I, I did my best to go win the hearts and minds. What that meant to me at this moment in time is that I'm gonna go to talk to the folks who operate these tests and I'm gonna tell them the dangers of high temperature and high pressure equipment. <laughs> because, so here, so okay, now this is the point where you get to rip me apart a bit. Like, um, I really thought that was a good idea. I did, at the time. So if I thought that was a good idea and I thought it was gonna solve the problem, let's start here. What problem did I think I had if I thought that was a good solution? that they didn't know, dumb workers, dumb, dumb workers. <laughs> right, that, that people didn't know, and then I was gonna fill the gap with my expertise. Say it. They didn't, know they didn't know or care, yeah. So I'm gonna fill the gap with my expertise, and then we're all gonna shake hands. And, and so this is how this went, so picture this. I'm 10 years younger than I am now. Um, I don't know if you can tell how old I am, but I looked about 12 at the time that I was doing this, right? Um, and I, I have my little hard hat on. It's very, it's very white. It hasn't been out in the field a lot. Um, and I have my computer, and I go, and I go into this, I go into this control room. There's about 15 folks in this test, and I bring my little computer, and I put it down. And I worked really hard on this presentation, right? Like I, I researched, you know, the pressure and the temperature, and I showed like what would happen if it failed. I researched failure rates. Like I presented all of this information about like, hey, if you are in this corridor, like this is the chance of it failing. This is what it's gonna look like. This is what it would do to the human body. Like this is no joke. This is no joke. And I, ready? You, are you okay with handshakes? Okay. And then I said, and I care about your safety and I know you care about your safety and the company cares about your safety. So we're never gonna use this corridor as a pass-through again, right? right? And Patrick says, right. <laughs> and then we sign a piece of paper and we say that we've had this training and I feel really good about myself, right? I drop the mic and I walk out. <laughs> what did I change? Me feeling good about myself. Somebody said nothing. Yeah, I mean, you're probably right that I didn't change a lot of like the, the problem that I was trying to change, right? I didn't, I didn't change the corridor, but I did, I did change something. 
Yeah, tell me more. Their view of me. That's exactly what I changed. And it wasn't, so this is when you get to rip me apart and feel, please, I deserve it. So feel, like, have fun with it. What did I, how do they see me now? Like, what, I mean, I don't know if they had a good view of me before, but, like, at this point in time, what, how do you think they felt about me? Just <laughs> so grateful that I told them, right? Super grateful. It's just, no, what did, what did they think about me? Safety cop, she don't know. What, like, kind of like pat me on the head and like turn me around and scoot me towards the door. Like, sort of like, yeah, bless your heart. This wasn't in the South, or we might have said that. So like, here you go. Um, that was cute, right? So something like that. I don't, think I, I don't think I was much of a threat, but I don't think, I, I certainly didn't ally myself as like a, hey, I'm gonna partner with you on things. It was, it was kind of like, oh, well, we gotta wait for her to leave, <laughs> clearly. Maybe she'll get another job somewhere else. All right, so that was attempt number one. As you can probably imagine, it didn't change very much in terms of the use of that corridor. So I, I had put this corridor on an audit sheet for me. So I had le weekly audits, as many of us had to do, right, or have, are doing. And so it was part of my audit. And so I, it was within like three days of having this conversation in which we shook hands and <laughs> that I saw somebody else use this pass-through as, as like this corridor as a pass-through. Um, so now I, I'm looking for direction of what to do. I go back to the plant manager and I said, hey, I did the, I did the hearts and minds thing. Um, doesn't seem like anyone really has changed anything. What do you want me to do now? Any idea of what the suggestion was from the leadership team? Write them up, hold them accountable. Discipline. How do you think they worded it? Like, if you could guess, just based on like your life experience, what do you like? What words came out of their mouth? Write them up. Write them up. Why? They're violating safety rule. I mean, it, it didn't come from like a terrible place. It's not like these humans are bad humans, right? It came from a a place of thinking that it was going to fix something. So we use like they need to understand the expectation. They need to understand that this is a company requirement. They need to understand that they could die. They need to understand we're serious about it. They need to understand that we're serious about safety. Those are the, and it's a condition of employment, right? So those were the words I was pretty familiar with hearing. And actually, in this case, we probably would have even labeled this as like a flagrant violation of a life-saving rule, right? Because this would consider lockout, tagout in our world, like maintenance or the people that would be. So like you could, you could take this to a place of feeling like this is a, like a major, major violation. So myself and the supervisor were given a directive to go use progressive discipline. And in my world, probably similar to yours, progressive discipline was like a coaching conversation, then a verbal warning, and then a written verbal, and then a written written, and then a day off, and then a three days off, and then a maybe final something, and then termination, something like that. I don't know. I, sound right? Something like that? Close enough. So I did my audits, and I got actually to the point of having a, one written warning for one of these 15 people. Right, so got up to, like, we had the verbal, I did the coaching again, like, we did all that, and I got to a written warning with one of these 15 people, and then when I did my audits from then on, I didn't see anybody using that corridor as a pass-through. Did you do your audits without David? No, so David asked, did I do my audit the same day, the same time? No, I was super tricky, right? So I was the trickiest of the tricky, where I did it different time, Different day every week. You don't know when I'm coming. I could come out of nowhere. <laughs> so, oh man. So, okay, let's pause here for a moment. If, and this is kind of the crux of what we're going to be talking about, like after this story, but like let's start to think about it now. If, why do we use disciplinary action? Like, if we thought it was going to solve something, it's a s solution. What was the problem that we were trying to solve? Like, what did we think the disciplinary action was going to do? Change behavior. Change behavior. Why? Because that's what psychology says, right? Change behavior. Why, right? Because carrots stick, Andrea. Carrots stick. You didn't learn about individual psychology before. All right, so change behavior because of Fear of consequence, is that fair to say? 
Okay, change behavior because of fear of consequence. It did change behavior, it absolutely did. It just wasn't the way I wanted it to be changed, right? So any idea, let me tell you the evidence and then you tell me what happened, right? So okay, so I've done this, written warning, once again, I'm feeling real good about myself because my audits are looking great, so I drop the mic again. I finally fixed this problem, but I keep up with my audits, my tricky audits. And it's about two months later, I got really busy, and I so I have a metric requirement on my audits. I have to do them every week, and I realize it's Friday, and my schedule is booked. I'm not gonna be able to do my audits, and I don't wanna miss it. So I convince myself that I should let the intern do it. It'll be good for you. Yeah, you'll get to know the site, right? So I give the audit to a new intern and convince myself it's the right thing to do, right? And then the first thing I noticed when he came back with the audit sheet is that within a 15 minute period of time he had seen three people using that as a password. Okay, so that's the evidence. Now tell me what did I do? Like what was actually happening? I dropped the mic thinking I fixed this. What was actually happening? They're watching me. But I was so tricky. You know what I found out later? Which is just, this is funny to picture, so just picture this. These test cells are like at the end of the actual like campus. So it's about a 10 minute walk to get there. So they're just watching me. They get a 10 minute warning before I get there. <laughs> ah, safety girl's coming, guys. So, I don't know how you would feel in this situation. But so I, I realized that they, they weren't doing it in front of me. And you, I mean, you've heard words for this. This is a compliance mentality, right? This is the idea of people do what you, if you're some sort of, or if you think you're some sort of authority figure, or if you're somebody who can like dish out some sort of consequence, they do one behavior in front of you to avoid a consequence, or even just like a consequence can include like an uncomfortable conversation. And then when you leave, like if you as the enforcer, you're not there anymore, well then people go back to what they thought the right thing to do was to begin with. So that, that's what was happening. And this is how you can get in an organization. Um, I don't, did you ever, do you ever use the term watermelon metrics? Is that something that's, so in our world, it's kind of a fun term, it's not a great reality, but if I, so the watermelon metric is when you have a metric sheet like my audits and they're green, like my audits looked really good and then you scratch right under the surface and it's bright red under. Doing things like this type of compliance mentality, which we often do by accident, I did it by accident, is how we get to a place where what our numbers look like is not the reality of what's actually happening. My numbers looked really good, my audits looked really good, people were still using it as a pass-through every day. That's not how I viewed it at the time, though. So I find out, I get this audit sheet back, and I'm not like, oh my gosh, I've created a watermelon metric. <laughs> I'm the problem, it's me. Like, that's not what I thought at the time. Um, any idea what my emotion was? Hurt? Pissed off? Why? Yeah, I mean, it felt like everyone was lying to me. I mean, because they were, but it felt like, <laughs> it felt really personal. Like, we shook hands, Patrick. <laughs> we shook hands. And you've been lying to me the whole time, and now I'm thinking about all the times that I've been standing there in that control room watching people, and they're just, now I know they've just been standing there waiting for me to leave. And suddenly I feel hurt, I feel angry, I feel shame, I feel lots of things. So I go back to the leadership team. What would you do, by the way, at this point in time? Like if you are me, what do you think you'd do? Get a different job. <laughs> yeah, I probably should have. <laughs> Just walk away. What do you think you'd do? Like, it's still a problem. The problem hasn't gone away. Say it again. Ask for advice. Ask for advice. Yeah. No, I had tried that a bunch, right? And I kind of felt like I had been led astray. Yeah. Yeah, where's the supervisor in all this? Yeah, so he was not really writing people up. I found that out afterwards. I didn't know. I was the only person writing people up. He was, he was in the room too, right? He was, he was the one using the corridor. No, he wasn't. But yeah, I, so the super, I thought I was like hand in hand with the supervisor and I might have been, ish. I found out why later, but I found out why later. Um, so I go back to the leadership team and um, kind of out of frustration, I just said, you told me I couldn't interlock. Like I wasn't allowed to interlock, but could we just lock the door? 
like regular lock and key. Let's not get fancy. Just lock the door and give the keys to maintenance. Can I do that? Does the FAA need to approve a door handle? Like, can I do that? And they're like, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> like, wish you had told me that forever ago, right? <laughs> so I get the lock. I get the key. That's not true. I wrote a work order. I had to wait three months for it, right? Like, as you know, right? And then finally, maintenance got around to installing it. And because I am the best safety professional there could be, I went to go verify that it was done. So I went to go do my secondary verification that we had actually completed the thing that we said we were going to complete. And I get there, and sure enough, there's a lock on the door. Great. And I just attest it. It's locked. And I found the key above the door ledge. Excellent, exactly, excellent. So I put it in my pocket, and I said, you know, maybe it was by accident. I'll give it back to maintenance. But I decided I'm going to come back later that day just to check, just to see what happens when you take the key away that was over the door ledge. So I came back later that day before I went home, and I get there, and the first thing I do, no key up there, check the door, it's locked, pull on the door, it opens. And there was tape <laughs> on the door to prevent the door from locking. Ah, OK. So this is when I did what I probably should have done at the beginning, but I didn't know to do yet. And I, and I didn't even do this next step well. I did it out of frustration. I went to go talk to people. No, no, that's not true. I went to go yell at people, but I was lucky enough that they were willing to talk to me. So Rob just talked about psychological safety and the need for people to be able to show you the, the, the desire for you as a leader to be able to ask questions like, tell me, help me understand. I didn't know any of that. I, I walked in, created zero psychological safety, and said, would somebody please tell me why we keep using this door as a pass-through? You could die. Not the way you create psychological safety, by the way, just to clarify. <laughs> Yelling at people. But I was really lucky because there was, a, there was a guy that was there. He's been working there for, for 30 years. And honestly, he didn't need me to create a space for him to be able to talk to me. All he needed me to do was even attempt to ask a question, and he was willing to talk to me. So he looked me dead in the eye, and he said, Andy, it's because your rule is stupid. And I very thankfully, I don't know why in this moment of time I said this, but it was very helpful and sort of changed my thought process. I, through gritted teeth, like not even done well, said, tell me more. <laughs> Which, if you ever have an opportunity, somebody's behavior doesn't make sense, or an expectation doesn't seem to be being followed, and you have the ability to hit that pause button and ask somebody to tell you more, you can learn more in the next five minutes than I learned in like the, I don't know, at this point, this is like a five-month process that we've gone through so far. And I said, tell me more. And he said, Andy, what you probably don't understand is that we don't use this corridor as a pass-through while the engine is at full throttle. We only use it while the engine is idling. Now, for translation, lower temperature, lower pressure. Still enough that you could get seriously injured, though, right? So I, I thought about it, and I thought, well, I did a risk assessment. That's pretty cool. But honestly, in my mind, I was like, but it's not good enough, right? It's not good enough. The risk assessment, you could still get seriously injured. So I said, I appreciate that, but you could still be seriously injured at that temperature and pressure. And he looked at me, and he said, well, then perhaps you've forgotten, Andy. The part of the quality checks we have to do on this engine, we have to go into the test cell, stand next to the engine while it's idling with that same temperature and pressure equipment you're so concerned about in this corridor. And then he said, and perhaps you didn't know this, Andy, but when you guys were deciding to design this whole thing, we asked you for cameras to be put into the test cell so we didn't have to do that. And you all told us it was too expensive to do. And then he said, 
And perhaps you didn't know this, Andy, but we used to have two groups of people to run these test cells. When you put this new one in, you decided there was enough automation that we could do it with one team, but you didn't give us a fast enough way to get from test cell one to test cell two to actually run them simultaneously. Or did you not know that either? No, I didn't know. So, so what's really weird about this, yeah, <laughs> biggest piece of humble pie I think I've ever eaten. What's strange is that like, I actually did know that information, but I had not pieced it together from their reality. Like I understood, like I knew that we had to go into the test cell for that portion of the test, and we would consider it an inherent risk of the test. And I know we had tried to design it out and we were struggling to do that. But in my head, I had taken that part of what they did and put it in a different box. And this corridor piece, this was unnecessary. Unnecessary risk, necessary risk. So I had partitioned it in my brain to make it make sense for me, but obviously from their perspective, did not make sense at all. By the way, the cameras themselves, it wasn't that the cameras were expensive, it's the FAA thing, right? So you have to prove to the FAA that the camera is as good as the naked eye, they're going in to look for leaks, and that's really, really hard to do, right? So that process is very expensive. So, I'm gonna tell you what we did, solution set-wise, so that you can function, because I know like we hear a problem, and then we're like, well, what'd you do about it? So I'm gonna tell you what we did, but then we're gonna back up to the thought process piece of it. Um, so we ended up guarding the inside of that corridor. This was not my idea, by the way, this was their idea. They're like, well, why can't we just guard it so we can walk through it, and I'm like, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so we ended up guarding the inside of that corridor so you could use it as a way to get from one to the other, and if anything did fail, you'd be protected. And then we were on our third round of testing cameras when I left the site. It's very hard to do. They, were, they had moved on to infrared cameras to test it to see if they could prove that it was as good. I, to this day, I really don't know if they have cameras in those test cells or not. Um, I could call, I haven't. <laughs> Because I want to believe, I really want to believe that they were able to find a camera and I'm really, they might not have, right? It was very hard to figure out how to do. So, if I could do this over again, any idea where I should have started? We're talking to people. Well, it sounds so dumb in retrospect. Yeah, talk to people. Talk to people, and yet it's like not, nor sometimes it's not the first thing that we think of. Like many of us in the room, and myself included, like the first thing that we actually think of is like, hey, let's lock the doors. Because it kind of feels like a simple problem, so it probably feels like it's a simple solution, and so we, we, and we end up solving the wrong thing. Any idea why I didn't talk to them? Say it again. I thought I already, yeah, I thought I already knew. You could be even meaner than that. It didn't even, I mean, to be completely honest, it didn't even cross my mind. It didn't even cross my mind to start by talking to them. I don't know if you know this, but it's really hard to do something that doesn't cross your mind. <laughs> didn't even cross my mind. Why? Thought I already knew, why else? Exactly, I had this thought process that the problem was the people. The people were the problem, and, and I had a lot of soul searching to do after this moment in time, because I would have told you like personality-wise, that's not how I generally see the world. I don't see the world as people being in the problem. But for some reason, in my work world, in this environment, my first thought, Right, the thing that I was leaning towards, that I would bias towards, is that the people were the problem. And there's lots of reasons for that. Right? There's many, many reasons. And that's this idea of like the individual blame that, that Rob was talking about. Like, there's many reasons why we blame people and why we look at people as a problem. One of the reasons that I did not even have an idea existed was kind of from how organizations even set up how we manage. So I think you saw on that, on that chart that Rob put up. Yeah. Right, so, that, so, Taylor, so what's Taylorism? Yeah, scientific management. 
What else about Taylorism? Say it again. You work, I think. Yeah, so, so it's kind of like the, I mean, you probably all know this. This is this idea of compliance is where sort of we, we start in our journey here. And, and whether you call it Fordism or Taylorism, like the idea at the time that the principles of scientific management were written, if you haven't read it, it's, it's definitely worth reading. The idea of this paper, if you're not familiar with the paper, this, this term Taylorism comes from Frederick, Frederick Winslow Taylor. And he wrote a really, really, really influential paper at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And it was called The Principles of Scientific Management. And he was helping figure out how do you lay out, like, a, like what do factories look like? Like, how do you lay out something efficiently? How do we move from this idea of having a master craftsman, which we had before the Industrial Revolution, to like, okay, now we can have a bunch of people and we have to mass produce things. And he had a lot of really influential ideas that are used today. Like, he's one of the first people to lay out that you, pr you probably shouldn't try to create a bunch of master craftsmen. Instead, you should teach people how to do a small portion of something, and then they're going to pass it on to somebody else who you've taught how to do a small portion of something else. So the foundation of manufacturing ideas that we have today. But he also reflected the classism that existed at the time. So folks that were coming into factory setting, many of them were unskilled labor, and he had a very strong opinion about the people, as did many, right? He's not, he just is the one with the famous paper, right? It wasn't, his ideas weren't, weren't different from others at the time. But he said things in this paper like, the worker does not have the mental capacity that the planner has in most situations. He talked about the concept of soldiering, which is like the idea that you know, people would come to work and they'd do like the bare minimum to get away with it. So you had to like watch them and observe them and time them. A lot of the management like stories he told, it feels like a lot of manipulation. He kind of pictured himself as like this puppet master and he was gonna tell people partial truths to kind of get them to do what he wanted them to do. Um, and whether or not you attribute it to them or you just attribute it to classism or whatever you want to attribute it to, what I realized in my, myself at this moment in time is that I was highly affected by these ideas of what my role was in an organization and I had been taught to think about my role in a very specific way. I had been taught that my role as a supervisor, as a safety professional, was to be in the parent ego position and that the people that I was helping, leading, we're supposed to be in the child ego position. And that's how I was taught to relate. Meaning, and in this parent-child relationship, you don't have to think of like this sort of like command control sort of like dictator thought process. You could think of like a very nurturing environment where like my role was to coach, to teach, to gently correct, to observe, to make sure that you have what you need. You could think of it that way, because I think that that's what I thought. But what's fascinating about this parent-child relationship is there's not a lot of like two-way communication going on. There's a lot of me in the parent ego position thinking that I should know. So, in this situation, I truly believed that it was my job to correct the behavior and to teach people about the dangers that they did not know of. And I believed that because I believed that that was my role as the leader, the safety leader, to tell you what you don't know, to educate you, to guide you, to make sure you understand it's important. The same way you might picture teaching a child. If I had been picturing the folks as adults, which is what we're striving for in this space, and what we need in this idea of discipline and accountability, adult interaction, adult-adult interaction is very different. In an adult-adult interaction, I see somebody use that corridor. If I think of that person as a fully functioning adult human with some amount of expertise in what they're doing, what do you think it's natural for me to do at that point in time? Say again? Ask a question. I mean, just, I mean, any question would do. <laughs> Start a conversation, ask a question, because, because truthfully, if, if it's not, hey, Patrick, sorry, I, I asked you if you're okay with handshakes and you didn't know what you're getting into, right? If it's not, hey, Patrick, I need you to do this, and instead it's like, hey, Patrick, fully functioning adult human, I don't say this out loud, by the way, fully functioning adult, 
I mean, you could if you want, but it gets weird. So fully functioning adult human that knows, like, that, that understands your own world, the first thought is, why would you use that as a court? What do you know that I don't know? And then you seek that information. But if I think of you as a child, then I'm like, Patrick, you know the stove is hot. Don't reach to the stove. Okay, let's take this dynamic and let's push it to the extreme for a moment. Picture a toddler who's learning about the world and you're the parent. Many of you have real life experience in this, right? So picture that. Your toddler goes to reach for the stove. What do you do? <laughs> Jason, smack him. What do you Okay, you could smack him, that's one option. What else do you do? <laughs> what do you do? Stop them in a more gentle manner, move them, and then what do you do? Explain, well, what do you explain? <laughs> Write them up. What do you explain? It's hot, you explain the danger, right? You teach them, you tell them. Are you seeing a parallel to what I did? You're seeing a parallel, like if I, I mean I can draw it for you, but you're smart, you see the parallel to what I did? Okay, so you teach someone, you explain that it's hot. And then, after you've done that, they go back and they do it again. Then what do you do? What did you say? Excuse me, non-functioning adult human. Yeah, excuse me, non-functioning adult human, you are not, right? At that point, maybe you put them in time out. Progressive discipline. And you would say something to yourself is like, I really like time out is a much better option for you to learn this lesson than getting burnt. Unless you're Jay in which you just apparently let them get burnt. Yeah, it's just a different generation, right? I mean, so, so that's the other option, right? You have that option and I'm not taking it away from you, Jay. You do it, you do you. Um, but this idea, right, so you put the person in time out. I, re I realized in this moment in time, I realized that was the same mental model we were using for disciplinary action at my facility. But we weren't dealing with children. We were dealing with fully functioning adult humans that in most cases knew far more about what was actually happening and the process than any of the rest of us in the leadership team did. And that's when I started to say, huh, that hurts to know, but what about accountability? Does that mean we just like give up on accountability? What about it? You guys had an opportunity to take a look at some of these ideas of error, mistakes. Um, and I really, really like what's laid out and what has been taught in the human performance space and what Rob showed about the difference between error um, and the different types of error. In my world, we got really caught up with the verbiage. And I realized that we were actually only dividing things into a few categories in our minds. And the two categories that we were dividing things into was error and violation. But violation didn't mean what was on the screen when Rob had it up in our world. What did violation mean in our world? Malicious intent, bad human, breaking rules, don't care. I don't know, I mean, all the terrible things that you could label about a person. That's what violation meant in our world. So I started to use the word mistake instead of violation. You don't have to. I, you use whatever makes sense. So I started to say, well, did we make an error? Did we make a mistake? Or did we actually have sabotage where we did have bad human Terrorism, malintent. Now these are actions or inactions, by the way. But what was really hard in our organization is the idea that when somebody makes an error or a mistake, that we should be doing the whole like adult, adult, let's have a conversation and understand so we can learn and improve. We don't leave it broken. You don't just say, ah, you can go in that corridor. You don't leave it broken, but you just understand enough to understand what the real problems are so that we are solving the right problems, so we're not just doing things based on assumptions. So in my world, see if this sounds good to you or sounds real for you. We were pretty good at stomaching error by this definition, meaning that like, like if you picture slip trip laps, like we were really good or like mixing something up. We were good 
at knowing how to respond as leaders when there is an error. Because you're like, oh, like if that thing's confusing, it's confusing for kind of everyone. That makes sense. Does that sound right in your world or not? Yeah? Where we got really, really very confused about what to do is when we saw something as a violation, or in this term, well, I have a mistake up here, when we saw it as a violation. When somebody's kind of, like, they did something intentionally. So you can picture, so a simple example, difference between the two, right? If you are picturing changing lanes, and part of the rule of changing lanes is that you should be checking your blind spot. You can picture a scenario in which you plumb forget to check your blind spot. We call that by what's up here, an error. But you can also picture a scenario in which you choose not to check your blind spot. Why would you choose not to check your blind spot? It's not because you're a bad person. Why? Because your thing on that car goes beep, beep, beep. For whatever reason, whatever the contextual reason is, at that moment in time, given your specific context, you were 100% certain that no one was in your blind spot. Maybe it's because the thing on your car goes beep, beep, beep and warns you. Maybe it's because you had just changed lanes a minute ago and you know you're going back to the space you just came from. Maybe it's because you're on a dark road and you haven't seen another car for forever. You are 100% certain. The weird sort of uncomfortable space in this hop world is the recognition that even when somebody does intend their, their action or their inaction, that similar to not intending it, other people given the same information and environment would probably make a similar decision. So if other people given the same information and environment would give, make a similar decision, we're not dealing in this case with people issues, we're actually dealing with system issues and we really wanna be able to learn in this whole area. You don't have to learn about the sabotage, the malintent, get that person out. But it's hard because the other words that we have in this space around mistake are violation, rule breaking, deviation, drift, sometimes adaptation, and depending upon how you feel about it, all of those words mean something different to each person. The person, gr gross negligence, they violate it. Like if you wrap whatever term, that term is gonna reflect how mad you are at that moment in time that the person didn't follow some sort of expectation or guidance or guideline. And so then the question is, how do you deal with that? Do we just use disciplinary action? Do we go back to this parent-child relationship? And I think, maybe what I learned the hard way, see if you agree with this or not, is that in my world, we had absolutely confused the concepts of accountability, disciplinary action, and consequences. If you're willing, would you be willing to teach me when someone in your organization says, Patrick, gosh, poor Patrick, he's like, why am I sitting here? We need to hold Patrick accountable. What, is that, what does that mean without using the words hold or accountable? Or can you translate that for me? Say it again. Punish that guy? Does that mean that in most of your world? Sometimes, sometimes not? How many people is it like hold, we need to hold that person accountable almost directly to we need to do some sort of like consequence of some sort, like PIP or HR disciplinary action? No, not in everyone's world? You guys, are your, hand, are your arms just tired? I'm trying, like seriously, I'm trying to figure out. Yes or no? Yeah, kinda? Okay, all right, because um, if not, that's, I mean, that's okay, and that's probably great. I just wanna make sure that it, any of this is making sense. Um, so in my world, when we said that we need to hold that person accountable, we really meant we probably need to use HR disciplinary action. Or we'd say that person needs to be disciplined, and we thought they need some sort of consequence, a wake-up call, because what they did was unacceptable. We want and need accountability. I mean, I'd argue, you don't have to agree with me, but I'd argue that we want and need accountability by a definition much closer to what's on the screen here than what I was taught in my organization. Accountability is someone's willingness to accept responsibility for their actions and to account for 
They need to tell the story of their actions. It's not punishment. It's not retribution. It's not something you can demand from someone. In a certain situation, a person either feels accountable or they don't. I feel responsible for my actions or I don't feel responsible for my actions. And there's a, a few buckets as to why that can be true, right? So part of it has to do with who we are as people, right? Whatever, uh, however you want to label that. Who, if you're going to sit down with a, you know, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, whatever you're unpacking about who you are, what you think is true about the world, that is part of your view of accountability. Whether you're in a victim mindset, whether you're in a growth mindset, all of that plays a factor. We can't necessarily control that. Okay, let me say that again. You can't control that. You can control it. You can't control it in other people. But there's another very large factor as to whether or not somebody can feel accountable. And that has to do with the environment that they're in. And in that space, we do have some amount of control or at least influence. There are environments where it is difficult for any human, independent of who they are, to feel accountable. And there are environments where it's quite easy for most humans to feel accountable. And I'm just going to describe them to you so that I mean, you can assess, because I know where I came from. I know where I came from. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like in your world. A low accountability environment, picture something like this. Picture, it's, it's like highly command and control. Like when you come into work, you as the person who is feeling this environment, you kind of feel like a cog in a wheel. Uh, you feel like a number. You feel replaceable. The thought is kind of like bring your body to work, don't necessarily bring your brain. You're treated a lot in a parent-child relationship where you're the one in the child ego position. Things are done to you. Sometimes it's said that they're done for you, but they're done to you. You might come into work and a bunch of things are changed and you didn't even know why they were changed. The rules of what you're supposed to follow and the expectations change without your input. And people don't seem to be very interested in your thoughts around whether things are working well or not working well. In that environment, it's hard for any human, independent of who they are, to feel accountable. Because it's hard to feel responsible for your actions if you don't think your actions are your own to take. If you don't have any agency, or you don't believe you have any agency, it's hard to feel responsible. You just feel like a victim. And you can hear it. Like, when you walk into an organization, when you walk and you talk to people, you can hear low accountability environments. In, in those environments, people say things like this. They say, it's not my job. Hey, don't talk to me about that. Talk to my boss. I was just following the procedure. Oh, I sent you an email on that a week ago. You'll find it. Hey, that's not me. That's not my job. Now, in any group of people, you're going to find a subset that is apathetic to their job. That's not what I'm talking about. A subset of, you're going to find people who are apathetic, independent of how good your environment is. What we're talking about is if that's kind of like what it sounds like a lot, that's not a product of the people you're hiring. That's a product of the environment that we've created. But you can picture the opposite, right? You can, picture, you can picture an environment where you don't feel like you're a cog in a wheel, where like when changes are made, people are interested in your thoughts on it, where you're invited to the table. Things aren't done to you, they are done with you. Or if they can't be done with you, at least whether or not it's working well, you are asked repeatedly to partake in discussion around that. Where your ideas are taken seriously, where you're not in parent-child relationships a lot, you're in adult-adult relationships, and if you have a differing opinion, somebody's willing to engage in conversation with you. In those environments, you can feel it. You can feel the difference. I'm sure you have had the opportunity in working in teams that have low accountability and working in teams that have high accountability, and you can feel I mean, people are just high accountability environment. People are like, yeah, no, I can help you out with that. Or, hey, let me show you. This thing that we put in place, it's just not working. That new program that you're rolling out, let me, let me tell you about what's actually happening. Once again, even in that environment, subgroup of people are going to be apathetic. And even in a low accountability environment, subgroup of people are going to be able to take accountability. But when you're seeing a large group of folks talk and feel one way, it's not who we're hiring, it's how we're treating them. This doesn't mean we don't use HR disciplinary action. 
But if you walk away with just like one thing that I think is helpful, you can tell me. HR disciplinary action doesn't create accountability. HR disciplinary action is a fair way to give someone a chance to change what's going on before you ask them to leave. It's a fair way to deal with a system, or sorry, a person problem, not a system problem. And a person problem, a person problem is actually not too terribly difficult to pick out. HR disciplinary action is a fair way to deal with a person problem. And person problems, you know who they are. Like today, like if you're close to the work, if you're working on a team, the person problem is not a surprise to folks. Like that's the person that when they finally do get removed from the job, everyone says, thank you, it's about time. You know, like in my, in my plant, so the, the last plant that I worked in, we had about 3,000 people that worked there. I can tell you, I can count the person problems, there were five. And I know them by first and last name, and most of them have nicknames. Right, so these are the people when somebody's on a team, they're actually not happy to have them on a team, not because they're a differing professional opinion, but because like if I'm actually working with this person, doing work in the field, I'm terrified that this human is not gonna listen to the rest of the team. I'm terrified that they're gonna do whatever they want. They, they, they're not listening to me, they're not listening to the supervisor, they're not meeting minimum expectations, they're not open to coaching, they never take responsibility for what they're doing. These are people that were like, we made a hiring mistake, or we made a positional mistake. Then you use disciplinary action as a fair way to be like, shape up or ship out. This is what's happening, this is what's, what it looks like, that's very, very different than a system problem. So, my difficulty is I think that I didn't know the difference between these two things. We want and need accountability, but accountability is not disciplinary action. We want and need disciplinary action as a fair way to deal with hiring mistakes. I confuse these all the time. Person problems, these are hiring placement mistakes. They don't pop up when an event occurs. Very rarely do you not know you have a person problem if you're close to the work. Like a person problem is a person problem before something bad happens and after something bad happens. We shouldn't need an event to be able to do something about it. It does require coaching, resetting expectations, reassignment, disciplinary action, and sometimes removal. And the problem goes away when they do. System problems, they require learning and improving, and sometimes they look like person problems on the surface. You don't have to wait for an event to happen to understand some of the system problems that we have. They cannot be solved with discipline. Actually, if we use discipline to try to solve system problems, what we end up doing is we end up actually creating that low accountability environment. So we end up doing the exact opposite of what we're trying to do when we misuse disciplinary action. And the problem does not go away when a person goes away. What do you think? Like it, hate it? Useful, not useful? Useful? Oh, is it, can we grab a, the microphone? Did I get you wet? I just, no, I just, no. okay, all right, good. Um, can we grab a microphone? Because you're about to say something brilliant, I think. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Over here, thanks. I can pass. Oh, okay, all right. She's got it, she's on it. Where's the question? Right here, or statement, I think. Yeah, David, tell us. And I can only speak for, for my organization but managers always have an issue between reliability and performance. They think that because we want to be reliable and resilient and learn, that they can't have performance discussions. They feel like this process is a roadblock. Mm -hmm. And we keep trying to, to, to tell them that they're not married. 
you can have a performance discussion from an event or from a behavior and still learn from that process. If you go back far enough to find out where the system is failing the individual or the organization. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a hard sell because as soon as something happens and you say, well, you know, what will we learn from this? Are you telling me I can't talk to the employee? Wow. And I think at least like in my world, I don't think we did a really good job dealing with person problems when we knew we had them. Like, like we would just pass somebody around from like department to department, you know, or they'd be like, oh, I can't touch that person. They've been here for forever. So we would have that. And that's when people would cry out, we need accountability. We need accountability. We're really, we, we didn't do a good job with performance management to begin with. And the only time that we tended to be able to feel like we could do something is when we had something bad happen, which at that point, that's when we want to be learning. And we're like, but our hands are tied because this is the only time that we feel like we can use disciplinary action to remove somebody, especially if we had a person problem and we let it like fester there for a long time and then that person happened to be involved in something, then in my world we'd be like, got him. Finally got him. And that's what we want to move. Like we can't snap our fingers and, and change all of this tomorrow, but if we have a clear vision of kind of where we're trying to go to be able to separate these concepts out, hope, I mean, we can influence that in that way. Yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember the uh, accountability ladder? Have you ever seen one of those before? I, I'm pretty sure we had it in our discipline structure. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the bottom, it said something like blame others, like I, I'm and no accountability. I'm somebody who blames everybody else. In the very top, it says make it happen. Hmm. Like I'm the kind of person that can, no matter what, I can make it happen. So uh, I worked at a nuclear plant for a, a while, and we had about 70 posters, and we actually had an actual ladder uh, in the cafeteria and uh, I had them all taken down. And, and the reason is, there was a mentality around to make it happen. They would add this little phrase at the end, they never said this out loud, but no matter what. So, and they thought that that was extreme accountability, but what they were doing is going in the corridor. <laughs> you know, and and uh, they were figuring out ways because that's what they felt accountability was. So we yeah. had to have a big discussion about that. So I was just wondering if, if we're, we're talking about almost like it feels like there's a lack of accountability, but what about when it feels like there's a lack of, uh, not a lack, but an extreme accountability? Like, how do you, uh, how do you approach that? Yeah, well, that's a really good question of just like, hey, I mean, and I think that in many, many places that is kind of the mentality of like, hey, we're so used to working with maybe not the, all the number of tools that we need. We're so used to just being out in the field and we're going to lean in and we're just going to get it done. Like, I don't think that that's an unusual thing that we're all facing. What I really like about the, the definition of accountability, like it's just the dictionary definition, what I really like about that definition is it's, it's the willingness to, to take responsibility for your actions, which includes that, right? It includes being able to tell the story of the actions of like, hey, I'm gonna tell you why I feel like I have to get this done. It's because I asked you guys for a camera when you were building this thing and you didn't tell me. Like you, you told us we couldn't do it, so what else do you want me to do? Like that, I'm owning what I'm doing Let's work on it together. Once we can get it out there, well then we know we're working on the same problem. So it, in, yeah, I, it's like not necessarily like extreme ownership, but it's extreme ownership of my own actions and my willingness to tell the greater story of why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's a really good question. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Uh, to me, <clears throat> the, the separation of person problems and systems problems, we dealt with that a lot. Yeah. And our conversation now is, again, the person is a part of the system, and it's about holding the entire system accountable. So I think separating them sometimes creates that issue. Yeah, maybe. If we really understand the whole process that the person, people, the program process, work of our organization, equipment, all work together as a system, and if people are a part of that, and the individual affects it every way, then you have a different conversation. It's a great point, and I'm gonna give two quick, quick examples of what I mean by person problems in case it's not clear. So if you picture, if you picture driving, and you got people that are in the slow lane, and you got people that are going a little bit above the speed limit. I would consider that all part of the system, and I wouldn't call any of that, even if you're going above the speed limit, right? Even if you're going a little bit above the speed limit, but all the rest of the people around you are doing it. That's the social norm that you followed, and actually if you were going slower in that lane, you might actually cause an issue. What I would be labeling in this case as a person problem is that one individual, and you've all seen them, the one individual that is weaving in out of traffic like this, that everyone's honking their horn at and saying, why is someone not taking care of this? 
that would be, in my mind, what we're dealing with when we're talking about a person problem. That problem of that individual goes away when that person is removed from the system. Yeah, really good point, though, because I, I, you'll have to teach me, right? If, if the separation of these two things does more damage than it does good, we'll find out, right? <laughs> yeah. Tanya. And I think, are we're, we done at 35, by the way? Yeah, we're at time. Go. Okay, we're at time. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Andy.